A.Q. Khan was a, a brilliant engineer, metallurgical engineer, who trained in Europe, in Germany and Belgium. And uh, he was highly regarded by his uh, thesis supervisor and highly recommended. So he got a job with Urenco, which is the uh, British, Dutch, and I think uh, one other country uh, consortium for working on uh, uh, centrifuges and uh, enriched uranium technology. So he was working there initially as a translator, but he gained the respect, the trust of the people there, and he was given uh, uh, bigger responsibilities. In, uh, he, was a, he gained access to the drawings of the centrifuges of the uh, Urenco, which was a leading uh, uh, organization in that field. And he got, also got access to the uh, list of suppliers for Urenco, the European suppliers, the Swiss, the Italians, the Germans, and all this. So uh, he was a nationalist, a Pakistani nationalist. And uh, in 1972, Bhutto had uh, declared that uh, Pakistan uh, should also have an Islamic bomb. And uh, he asked uh, Munir Ahmed Khan, who was the uh, head of the Pakistani Atomic Energy Commission, uh, an ex-IAEA man, the IAEA connection is, is there in the sideline, uh, to de develop a plutonium bomb. But uh, uh, after the Indian test 1974, uh, A.Q. Khan, now there's a, it's, it's unclear here whether he approached the Pakistani government uh, or whether the Pakistani government approached him. The long and short is he was asked by the Pakistan government to undertake work on enriched uranium. Well, the A.Q. Khan network was really a remarkable breakdown of the non-proliferation system. Uh, what you had was a really global network operating from more than a dozen countries uh, over the course of more than two decades that started off as an import network supplying Pakistan's nuclear program, but then got turned around into an export network that was supplying countries all over the world. So they were supplying centrifuge technology uh, which countries can use to enrich uranium to the level required for nuclear weapons. It's really the technology of choice for the determined nuclear cheater because it's small and easy to hide. And they were exporting that uh, to North Korea, to Iran, to Libya, at least. There's almost certainly a fourth customer. They talked in their internal communications about the fourth customer. We haven't yet identified exactly who the fourth customer was. Um, they also attempted to export to Iraq when it was still ruled by uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, fortunately, uh, the first Gulf War in 1991 cut short Iraq's nuclear weapons program before Iraq had the opportunity to take the advantage of the offer uh, from the Khan uh, network. Um, but they were also exporting actual nuclear weapon designs, at least to Libya and we strongly suspect uh, to other countries as well. They provided, for example, to Iran a uh, package of information about how to take uranium metal and cast it into the kind of spheres you would want for the core of a nuclear bomb. So the chain went from North Korea through China to Pakistan and to Iran and Libya with suppliers in uh, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, and other places. Some subcontract work being done in, Mal in Malaysia or Southeast Asian countries. And it, it, was, it was a very successful operation. I mean, A.Q. Khan claimed, uh, or the Pakistani military government claimed that this was a rogue operation, but I don't believe that because the aircraft which would be used to fly, to ferret the supplies from North Korea and elsewhere, were Pakistan government aircraft. What was new, in a way, about the AQ Khan network was this sort of global network of private entrepreneurs integrated by a participant in a state network, namely AQ Khan, um, that was sort of reaching out to potential proliferants and saying, look what we have to offer rather than a state putting together a procurement network saying this is what we need and going out and figuring out ways 
uh, to get it. This story had started in 79 and the agencies in the U.S. government had, had interfered with the, the arrest of A.Q. Khan and had uh, and accepted, uh, tolerated, not, not accepted, but tolerated uh, the weapons development by Pakistan's military government in the 80s because of other considerations on, on the American side. So I was not surprised at all. I mean, uh, I was surprised at the, when the revelations came out, uh, New York Times and others, and there's a lot, a lot of material on this, uh, th that about the extensive scale of the network. Well, I think what the Khan network revealed that was very distressing was first that there were sources of this technology who could be corrupted to sell it to practically anyone, not just in Pakistan, but in Switzerland and Germany and South Africa and the United States and country, a variety of countries all over the world, really, where participants were participating in this. Secondly, it revealed that uh, export controls were nowhere near as strong as they needed to be. A lot of this uh, activity was either not noticed or it was actually legal in the countries where it was taking place because their laws were so weak. Um, thirdly, I think it indicated that our intelligence capabilities and in particular our cooperation in intelligence between different countries was nowhere near as strong as it needed to be because it took decades to figure out this network and to take it down uh, ultimately. And I think fourthly, it showed that the world's law enforcement response is nowhere near what it needs to be. Almost all of the participants in the AQCon network are free men today, and they're largely rich free men uh, today. And that's not a good example to send to future potential participants in these kinds of black market networks. I think the IEA still has a ways to go in its work on nuclear smuggling. What they do now is they receive information provided by member states in, uh, and put it together into a database, uh, the International Trafficking Database. Uh, and, but what we often don't know from what states are willing to just provide officially and what you really need to find out through real investigation, going and interviewing people, talking to different police and intelligence people, etc., is where did this material come from? How did it get stolen? Uh, we need to move toward a world, and states, states don't really want to give that information, especially if they're the state that it came from, because they think it's embarrassing. But we need to move to a world where there is more opprobrium for keeping information about that other countries could learn from, from the IAEA, than there is for admitting that you had a problem in nuclear security in the past. Because if we don't identify how these kinds of thefts occur, then we can't learn lessons to prevent them from happening in the future. In the world of nuclear safety, we have much more in-depth you know, lessons learned, root cause analysis, and so on for each incident, and then distribution of that as lessons learned uh, to other facilities. None of that exists really for nuclear security and for nuclear theft and smuggling.